Good afternoon, ma'am. Good good afternoon, everyone. I am Dinesh Kumar. Research scholar in the Department of English, Chaudhary Devilal University, Sirsa. The topic of my paper is Existential Despair Amidst Humanitarian Chaos, a Critical Analysis of Macbeth and Hamlet. My research paper deals with a couple of fundamental questions. The first and the most basic question is, is life worth living or death is a better option? And the second fundamental question is, if life is worth living, then is life is predestined or it is what we make it through our choices and actions. I have taken one speech from Macbeth tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and a soliloquy from Hamlet to be or not to be to the reference to the gist of my research paper. The study traces the intrinsic relation between humanitarian crisis and existential crisis. Existential crisis in psychology is referred to as an inner conflict. It is a personal phenomena, but not entirely personal. The study traces that existential crisis is induced by the social conditions and it is often observed that existential crisis situation most often occurs when there is humanitarian crisis. For the latest example, I have traced the existential crisis during the mid 20th century age after the World War I and World War II. And 
from that humanitarian crisis. Hello. And from that humanitarian crisis after the World War II, when there were deaths in Nazi camps, when atomic bombs were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima in Japan, humanity failed and with that failed the very existence of human life. Existential crisis occurs when there is no hope remains with the life. Life becomes meaningless and future seems hopeless. It can also be related to identity crisis. However, an identity crisis is a state of gender confusion, personality mismatch and self-esteem issues, whereas an existential crisis occurs from the realization of distorted realities. I have first dealt with Macbeth and the question that is life predestined. Macbeth begins with the prophecy of three witches about Macbeth, that Macbeth being the Thane of Cardor and Macbeth is being the King of Scotland. Now Macbeth believes in the predestiny of life. He believes that whatever that is destined to be will happen and in believing so, he makes choices. His choices that leads to actions that brings humanitarian crisis. He first kills King Duncan and in the series of murders, he further kills Banco and orders for the death of Macduff and kills Lady Macduff and her children. Now when there is a whole scenario in which humanity has failed, the system has failed, there, is, there are no virtues that are left and from these arises existential crisis of Macbeth. First, Lady Macbeth begins to sleepwalk. He sees blood stains on her hands and then she commits suicides. On hearing that Lady Macbeth has died, Macbeth feels hollow and empty. He doesn't know that what to expect from life anymore and at this very moment he delivers the speech tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow which ultimately reflects his sense of nihilism and existential crisis. His world has fallen apart and he contemplates the futility of a meaning, meaningless life. Similarly, Hamlet begins against the backdrop of a murder. The play begins with that the ghost of King Hamlet talks to Prince Hamlet about his murder at the hands of his own brother Claudius. The ghost asks the prince to take his revenge. But Hamlet, as shown by Shakespeare, is a thoughtful and contemplative character. He seeks revenge for his father's death, but still he does not suffer a deep sense of melancholy or fit of madness in the beginning. It is through the series of humanitarian cures in which the conditions develop and make Hamlet and make Hamlet fall for the existential crisis. He is struck by the nature of justice and morality and is unable to decide whether he should silently suffer the death of his father or avenge it from his uncle and mother. His indecisiveness soon takes over him and he begins to be consumed by the sense of disillusionment and deliver the soliloquy to be or not to be. That is the question. A very influential critic of modern age, Albert Camus, he has also raised this question in his essay, <clears throat> The Myth of Sisyphus, in which he says, here is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. Hamlet has raised the same question, to be or not to be, that is the question. This speech reflects Hamlet's apathy about the human condition, life and death.
as observed in the case of both Macbeth and Hamlet, existential crisis is a psychological phenomenon, but not entirely personal. It is induced by the social conditions and humanitarian crisis. You have to conclude. Existentialism often contend, contend that life is fundamentally absurd and devoid of inherent meaning. It is up to individuals to create their own meaning and purpose in a seemingly indifferent or chaotic universe. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. I have one question. Uh, I'm audible to you, Dinesh. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your presentation. You have uh, very well uh, briefed us about uh, Hamlet and uh, that the existential crisis and how the existential crisis are related to uh, identity crisis, uh, how existential crises are related to identity crisis as well as the gender you have brought in. So uh, thank you for your good presentation. Uh, only one question that uh, do you consider that to be or not to be that Hamlet's uh, uh, sorry lucky is uh, has some contemporaneity also in it multiple times we have used that that the youngsters are representing in some of the other way that uh, to be or not to be that confusion is uh, always there with them uh, so uh, yes well this well, this confusion, I suppose, ma'am, is everywhere in all spheres of life. Uh, it can also be related to the road not taken poem by Robert Frost that there is always a dilemma. We always have to make a choice between Hamlet, however, is talking about making a choice between life and death. But in daily life also, in all spheres of life, there is always a question arises that whether to go for that or whether to not or to be or not to be I think is always a relevant statement. Thank you Dinesh. Thank you ma'am. So meanwhile can we take the offline presentation? One Priyanka is there. No? Priyanka, um, Priyanka is there for offline presentation. Uh, so can you uh, just come and present your paper? Meanwhile, because uh, one of our professor from uh, US, she also wants to join. Okay, so we have to keep the online uh, presenters. You have to please wait. Uh, one offline presenter is there, Priyanka. So she will present her paper. So please be there on that page.
Next online presenter, Miss Pallavi. Miss Pallavi, are you there? Yes, yes ma'am, I am here. Yes, Pallavi. Yes, so. And after Pallavi, uh, Sayog Sethi. So please be ready for your presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my respected greetings to the chair of the session. I am Pallavi, a research scholar at uh, CDLU Sirsa. I am uh, presenting a paper co-authored by uh, myself and my co-author uh, Archana Singh who is a PhD scholar at Himachal Pradesh University. Uh, the title of the paper is Reading Character and Plot the Significance of Soliloquies in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Hamlet by William Shakespeare is often described in superlatives, the most popular, most often played and published drama of the past over 400 years, not only in England but also in Western culture, whose core themes are presented through several soliloquies. In Hamlet, Shakespeare gives soliloquies either to villain or to the protagonists like Ophelia Hamlet. And they are pertinent to the play because they are beneficial in disclosing the most intimate thoughts of the protagonists. Uh, for example, Hamlet, his mental state, his changing attitude towards life and the other characters in the play. His dilemmas and fears on questions of morality and his reflection on the task of revenge that has been assigned to him. Perhaps the soliloquies of Hamlet are apart from building the structure of the play can also suggest the complex and chameleonic beauty of the character. Uh, the soliloquy in general is used as a means of revealing working of the mind of the character. It helps a dramatist to expose the motives, plans, actions of the character and it acts as a device by employing which the dramatist can communicate to the audience or to the readers the secret thoughts of the character while at the same time preserving the secrecy of those thoughts. By thus communicating to the audience or the reader the, the secret working of a character's mind. There are different opinions about Hamlet's soliloquies. Some critics argue that the speech, and I quote, to be or not to be, is not meant to be taken as a soliloquy at all. Rather, it is... Uh, considered as an act of fiend madness and melancholia directed towards Ophelia particularly, which Hamlet's resolute passion either side of the scene is considered. Uh, a, a very famous critic was thinks, and I quote, the soliloquy promotes punning between prey and prey because such a pun captures a central ethical debate surrounding the revenge tragedy which makes the reader aware of Hamlet's primary dilemma, unquote, shortly after the appearance of the ghost. And it helps finally to concentrate the distinction between mercy and vengeance, meditation and action, reflection and instinct. Again, some critics argue that the king's first soliloquy is not exactly a soliloquy, rather it is an aside because the king is not alone on the stage at that moment. Polonius is not expected to hear what the king says to himself. It is apparently obvious that the soliloquy is an indispensable means in the plot of Hamlet. It gives the reader a further understanding into Hamlet's personal and rational behind his actions, which steer the course of the tragedy further. Uh, without the soliloquies, the play Hamlet would lose its vital meaning and it is significant that there is no soliloquy in the last act according to uh, our uh, guest has already joined so please wind up your paper in uh, the concluding sure, remark I'll, just uh, I'll quickly conclude the paper uh, what I have drawn out from the text is that uh, in the seven soliloquies of Hamlet Hamlet shares his inner feelings, thoughts and plans for the future. These soliloquies are pivotal pillars of the drama and are considered some of Shakespeare's most brilliant writings. And without reading these seven soliloquies, one cannot 
completely understand and completely experience the drama gary taylor explains and i quote soliloquies are a convention conventions are a code and if we don't accept the rules of the code we will mistranslate the message against a shakespeare soliloquy there is no appeal so concluding myself i would just say that without the soliloquies the play would be inane and sporadic highly dramatic they give momentum impel it forward to new and exciting level by influencing plot characterization characterization and mood as well as it expresses key themes hamlet's highly dramatic second and third soliloquies are two such areas hence in hamlet soliloquies should not be considered separate speech uh, separate speeches rather they are essential to the action of the play thank you thank you pallavi thank you pallavi professor lisa hopkins has joined us uh, welcome ma'am uh, to introduce her um, she is the head of the graduate school faculty of development and society sheffield hallam university england she is a co-editor of journal of marlow studies and of shakespeare the journal of british shakespeare association and a series editor of arden critical readers and arden studies in early arden drama her most recent publications are the edge of christendom on the early modern english stage and a companion to cavendishes with tom rutter she also writes about detective fiction and her book ocular proof and the spectacle detective in british crime fiction was published by palgrave in 2023 we welcome you ma'am ma'am could you please unmute your mic please unmute your mic please and please unmute your mic there might be an icon on your screen in the form or in the shape of a mic please click on that प्रोफेसर हॉपकिंस देर इज एन आईटन इन द शेप ऑफ अ माइक प्लीज क्लिक ऑन इट Ah, it finally succeeded. I'm yeah. sorry. I've been clicking on it like a maniac. I knew where it was. Okay, it's you're audible. audible. You're audible, yeah. Professor Hopkins. Welcome. Right. Thank you. I'm so sorry. First, I I do know how to unmute myself, on, but it it has it genuinely has not been working, and I must apologise about my total failure to uh, understand about the time difference. That, I can't count for it. I could spend the next 20 minutes apologizing for that. But on the whole I think that one will not be very productive. So I'd like to talk about Richard the 3rd and Abe to hear my screen and do so. Please do this really if you are more interested. Can I see if I can do this? Can that work? Can you now see a, a PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Hello. It is visible, ma'am. Thank you very much. Okay, right, good. So I wanted to talk about the beginning of Richard the Third, a very famous speech, uh, so famous that it's been the source of of 
jokes in advertising uh, and of a lot of comment and a lot of people know it almost by heart. I just want to look at, first of all, the very beginning of it. And although this is so familiar, I wanted to just make it a little bit strange uh, and to think about what this is actually doing. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by the sun of York and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. A few things about this speech strike me as very worthy of note, and the first of them, the two words that I've uh, put in bold, now. Drawing attention to the contemporaneity of the scene, which is quite unusual for a history play, we are being taken back into the past, we're being invited to imagine ourselves not in our now, but in the now of Richard, uh, back in the 15th century, a hundred years back for Shakespeare's original audience. But it's also a very high-risk strategy. It's a very immersive one. Often now when you read historical novels, they're written in what's sometimes called the historic present. Uh, so although things are in the past, they're in the present tense as if to make you understand that they were still happening. This is, in a sense, the historic present. But it's a very risky use of the historic present. And it seems to me, actually, to be an example of what I often think is Shakespeare's most favourite tactic, and that is to make things difficult for his star actor, Richard Burbage. Sometimes it seems to me that if you look at Shakespeare's canon, you can see him <laughs> investing a lot of energy into making life hard for Burbage. Uh, at one point, when Burbage is about 40, Shakespeare writes King Lear and gets him to Act 80. Uh, in Macbeth, he gets Burbage's head cut off. We happen to know that they made a, a, a mock-up of Burbage's head for a different play, and uh, so Shakespeare goes, OK, well, let's do that. Uh, and here he is making Burbage take a huge risk because Burbage opens this play by coming out onto the stage of the Globe Theatre and saying, now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer, which is going to be absolutely lovely if it's nice weather in the Globe and it's going to be rather difficult to pull off if it isn't. And the British summer being what it is, it's not very likely to be nice weather. It might be, but then again, it mightn't be. I have seen this work brilliantly once, and that was in the, the reconstructed Shakespeare's Globe, uh, when Mark Rylance stepped out on the stage on a gloomy day, when it had been raining pretty much on and off all morning, uh, and at two o'clock the play started, Rylance stepped out onto the Globe stage, uh, and as he said these lines, now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York, at that very moment, the sun came out and he got a huge round of applause, although all he had done was speak the first two lines of the play. But as often as not, it doesn't do that. Uh, this is a real hostage to fortune. There's a very interesting account of how this kind of thing can work. In a book by Gwilym Jones called Shakespeare's Storms, he has a lovely anecdote about a time when they put on King Lear at the Globe and as the storm scene began, it really did begin to thunder and to lightning and to rain in London. Uh, and Gwilym Jones, who was working at the Globe at the time, heard somebody say to somebody else, how are they doing that? And of course, they weren't doing it at all. The weather was doing it by itself. But it was being received as if the weather was uh, intervening and actively playing a part. So now is the winter of our discontent. It works if the weather supports you. It doesn't work if the weather plays against you. Uh, and that's the first risk that Burbage is being asked to take. Go on, go out there and see how you get on. Burbage is also being asked to do some other things, and I'm not sure that we always fully understand uh, how soliloquies worked in the early modern period, but James Hirsch has written very convincingly about the fact that they're not meant to be heard as internal monologues. They are spoken language. And in so far as they are spoken language, one might expect the sound to have to support the sense. And yet, on a deliberate occasion in this speech, the sound does not support the, the sense, it cuts against it. And that's the last line of this quotation here. Our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Those two things are completely opposite to each other. Dreadful is opposite to delightful, marches is opposite to measures, and yet the 
patterning of the alliteration binds them together. So Burbage is being asked to deliver a rather difficult line there. But of course, he's also being asked to do various other things. He is being asked to talk about himself and his own person as it appears on stage. Why, I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain. Now, the first part of the speech has been all about our, our discontent, our house, our brows, our bruised arms, our stern alarms, our dreadful marches. This part of the speech switches to I. And you might think it's obvious that in a soliloquy, there's going to be a lot of reference to I. And actually, that's not the case at all. If you look at the most famous soliloquy in the whole world, which is Hamlet's to be or not to be, there is not one single instance of the words I or me in it. And the only time that he says my is when Ophelia has entered and he suddenly uh, says nymph in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. But until then, to be or not to be has been conducted in entirely impersonal terms. To be or not to be, it's an abstract question. He doesn't say, should I be or not be? He says, to be or not to be. I think that's one reason why so many people have found it very easy to relate to uh, to be or not to be, why it seems to be a kind of universal thing. But Richard is not doing that. Richard is talking about I, me, myself. I, in this weak piping time, my shadow, mine own deformity, I cannot prove a lover. I am determined to prove a villain. And in so doing, he is drawing attention to his own body his, and what he defines as his own deformity. And this is the second challenge that Burbage is being set. He has got to be, pretend to be deformed. There's got to be something about him that is different from everybody else. We know from other evidence that Burbage is not deformed. And there is a very interesting little anecdote to, uh, uh, told about this play, which is that when uh, Burbage acted Richard III, a, a, a housewife in the audience allegedly sent round a little note backstage saying, you know, I really like you and can we meet up afterwards? And that note was allegedly intercepted by Shakespeare, uh, who went off to keep the assignation himself and left a little message from Bur for Burbage, supposedly saying, William the Conqueror was before Richard III. Now that story may or may not be true. It, it's an anecdote. It has the status of, uh, of legend. But the point about it is, I think, that it's credible. Even if it's not true, it's believable. So Burbage himself seems to have cut a very attractive figure, and yet he's got to present himself as in some way deformed. And that is challenge number three. How do you present yourself as deformed? And in particular, do you or don't you want to evoke somebody who literally does live now, in the now of Shakespeare's own time? And that's the Queen's chief minister, Robert Sissel, who had a hunchback. He'd been dropped as a baby. Uh, so he uh, he did have a genuine deformity. Does Burbage look like him or does he not look like him? The emphasis on deformed is developed when he carries on talking about I, that I'm curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. And that's the first clue that we've had about what actually the nature of this deformity might be. Uh, he halts, he limps. Last year, the RSC, for the first time ever, cast a disabled actor to play Richard III, they Arthur Hughes. It was a magnificent performance. It was a very moving production, in fact. Uh, Arthur Hughes was born with a, an arm that is different from other people's arms. Uh, he also uh, limped for some of it. That deformity, that made a huge difference to the production of the play, that he could talk about deformity and demonstrate it. Everybody else has always had to act it. 
Most famously, it was acted by Laurence Olivier, who won Best Actor uh, for his per uh, performance of A Deformed Richard. Uh, that is very beautifully parodied in my absolute favourite Shakespeare film of all time, which is In the Bleak Midwinter, directed by Kenneth Branagh. It's a bunch of amateur actors putting on a production of Hamlet. Uh, the way that it works is that they're all auditioned at the beginning, and every single one of them comes on and, and does Olivier doing Richard uh, with various exaggerated deformities. It's also famously done by Anthony Scher. Uh, he had crutches. And the result of that, the, that series of performances was he had a bad back for the rest of his life. And when Kenneth Branagh did it at the Crucible Theatre Sheffield, the first thing he did was go and talk to some orthopaedic surgeons about how he could be sure that he didn't give himself a bad back. Uh, and so as a result of that, he just had a leg brace. He didn't do anything which would involve him at being actually damaged. We do not know if Burbage suffered any kind of long-term uh, illness or um, back problem from playing Richard III, but it's certainly a thing that has happened to actors in the past. And I just want briefly to then compare this with a different soliloquy. A character is introduced into the play, and in the middle of the play, halfway through proceedings, simply to speak these lines. He is a scrivener, and he says, here is the indictment of the good Lord Hastings, which in a set hand fairly is engrossed that it may be today read o'er in Paul's, and mark how well the sequel hangs together. Eleven hours I have spent to write it over, for yesternight by Catesby was it sent me, the precedent was full as long a doing, and yet within these five hours Hastings lived, untainted, unexamined, free at liberty. Here's good world the while. Who is so gross that cannot see this palpable device? When he says Paul's, he means old St. Paul's Cathedral in London, which was burnt down in uh, the Great Fire of London. So we, what we see now uh, bears no relation to the original of Paul's. And the original of Paul's was where the station is hung out, where people uh, bought and sold books. And I think the stationer is invi the scrivener is inviting us to consider ourselves what we might have bought in Paul's. And how true is that? How do we know when things are true? Prince Edward raises the same question. I do not like the tower of any place. Did Julius Caesar build that place, my lord? He did, my gracious lord, begin that place, which since succeeding ages have re-edified. Is it upon record or else reported successively from age to age he built it? Upon record, my gracious lord. But say, my lord, it were not registered, methinks the truth should live from age to age. As to a retail to all posterity, even to the general all-ending day. How do we know if things are true? And finally, a speech from the play that seems to be very significant, the people were not used to be spoke to by, by the recorder. The recorder is the person who writes things down. The people are used to passively consuming the information that the recorder gives them. But it seems to me that the motto of the play is that you should not just do that. You should, in fact, uh, not just passively consume information, you should be a maker of information. You should intervene. You should ask yourself, are things true? And, and the play is very interested in that question of are things true, are things not true? And it uses soliloquies of different kinds to demonstrate that. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. If anyone has any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. But otherwise, I have any yeah, madam, thank you very much. I wish you could come here personally. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. Or we will come there. <laughs> we want to see you. It's a long time we met. Yes, it is. I know. It must I be. I will soon see you there. Years. Thank you.
Yes, I think it might be 20 years. <laughs> Ma'am, could you speak a little loudly? You're not audible. I, I said it, it, it has indeed been a long time since I was able to come to India, and I'm very sorry about that. Hello. 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 I'm just getting a big booming sound now. Thanks a lot. Ma'am, could you please unmute yourself? Your mic is on mute again. Yes, but if there are no questions, I think it's probably time to go on to somebody else. Ask any question to Professor Hopkins. Uh, hello, madam. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sir. Okay, okay, okay. It's a long time we met. I'm planning yes. to visit you one of these days. I'll come oh, soon. Right. I wish you could come. It would have been a great pleasure. But you delivered the lecture all the same. We are very grateful. Highly grateful to you. Well, I'm sorry I can't come, but... But I'd be very pleased to hear... If there are other speakers, I'd be very pleased to hear somebody else talk. Thank <laughs> you. I'm aware I've deranged the program, but uh, perhaps is it possible that somebody else could do their talk now? Hello, Uh, goodbye then. We'll see you again. Take care. Oh, yeah. Uh, <coughs> something is better than that. <laughs> Now, those who are uh, online presenters, uh, I'm just uh, calling out your sequence so that and requesting also to wind up your presentation in five to seven minutes maximum because we are already uh, out of time. 
So uh, the next presenter is Sayyok Sethi. Are you there, Sayyok? Yes. After Sayyok, Vishwajit oh, yes, is supposed please. to present. After, after Vishwajit, uh, uh, Dr. Yeah, Neha yes, Sharma. Then uh, Mr. Uh, Prabhavod, if you are there. Oh, I think anybody else? Uh, then uh, Vandik and Jyoti is also there. So after that, Vandik and Jyoti, your presentation is there. I hope uh, I am audible for all of you. So, uh, straight away you have to come to your presentation, uh, your uh, point of views that you want to, instead of briefing us about the definition and other things. Okay. So what's your yes. take on that? Please uh, straight away come to that. What I hope uh, I am audible to all of you. Very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, this is Yog Sethi. I am a research scholar at Chodi Devila University, Sirsa. So the title of my presentation is Exploring Caliban's Voice, a Post-Colonial Critique of Shakespeare's The Tempest. So the Tempest, it has uh, been consistently examined from post-colonial perspectives by uh, several scholars. Uh, so viewed through the lens of uh, white man's burden, colonization was a method of acquiring new territories while imposing the uh, colonizer's culture upon the indigenous populations. So the character of Caliban, an indigenous uh, inhabitant of the island, has garnered uh, significant uh, scholarly attention due to his unique position uh, as both a target of colonization and a figure who challenges the dominant colonial power. Uh, so numerous uh, instances of Caliban's uh, resistance to the overarching authority are symbolized by Prospero. It uh, allows the readers to view the play uh, from the perspective of post-colonialism. <coughs> So my paper critically examines uh, Caliban's language, his identity, his interaction with Prospero, specifically highlighting the, his marginalized status and the impact of colonization on his culture and identity. It also considers the power dynamics between the colonizer and the colonized, uh, shedding light on the themes of subjugation, oppression and a quest for autonomy. So by analyzing Caliban's language and his role in the play, uh, my chapter it contributes to deeper understanding of uh, the complexities uh, surrounding colonialism, power and identity in Shakespeare's literature. So uh, talking about the post-colonial criticism uh, is a significant uh, viewpoint in the realm of literary and cultural studies. It came to the forefront during the mid 20th century and serves as a theoretical framework for analyzing how colonialism and imperialism have shaped literature and culture. So this critical perspective focuses on shedding light on the experiences, perspectives and identities of those who were colonized uh, and it scrutinizes how they are portrayed in literary works. So major literary theories for um, including Edward Said, Franz Fanon and Homike Baba, uh, they in their works have presented um, the basic tenets of post-colonialism. Um, for example, um, Edward Said in Orientalism, he explores the Western representation of the East, particularly the Middle East and Asia. He argues that Western scholars and writers, uh, through their works, uh, they constructed a uh, Eurocentric and uh, pejorative view of the audience, uh, perpetuating stereotypes and maintaining the power dynamics of colonialism. So on the other hand, Franz Fanon, he, in, in his works, The Rest of the Earth, um, he offers insights into the uh, psychological and socio-political aspects of decolonization. He explores the effects of colonization on the colonized subject and the violence that often accompanies the struggle for independence. So the study, uh, the play that I selected for this paper, The Tempest, is one of the finest plays by Shakespeare, a captivating tale of power and magic. So talking about the <clears throat> brief uh, summary of this play, the play is set on a remote island revolving around the exiled Duke of Milan, Prospero, who arrives on an uninhabited island and uses his magical powers to control the natural elements as well as the fates of those who end up on that enchanted <laughs> island. So it begins with a shipwreck uh, caused by a violent storm by Prospero, the rightful Duke of Milan. <coughs> and his younger daughter Miranda, who have been exiled to a remote island for 12 years by his brother Antonio, who used up his title. So on the island, Prospero, he gains control inhabitants, primarily aerial and airy spirits, and Caliban, who is native inhabitant of the island and son of the witch and Sacorex, often depicted as wild and physically a mishappened being. 
So the central character Prospero is a complex figure who exercises great control and authority over the residents of the island. He utilizes his mag magical abilities learned from Brooks. He um, brought with him into exile to manipulate and control the other characters. So this act of Prospero is similar to the situation of colonial history. Throughout the play, um, the, we can see that he grapples with the inner conflict between his thrust for revenge against his own brother and the opportunity for forgiveness and the restoration of strained relationships. Um, Miranda, Prospero's innocent daughter, has spent her entire life on this island without any knowledge of the outside world. So her encounter with the Prince Ferdinand who also survives the shipwreck leads to a mutual and instant attraction. And Caliban, whom the, this paper focuses, a savage native of the island, is portrayed as both a victim and a potential threat. His relationship with Prospero is uh, marked by tension, underlying themes of colonialism, and the abuse of power and the degrading treatment of indigenous populations. So Shakespeare's portrayal of the island as a place uh, rich in natural resources inhabited by indigenous people perceived as incapable of using the resources reflects a classic uh, orientalist misconception. The depiction of Caliban as savage, uh, devoid of culture, language, civilization, reduced to a state of servitude is a significant manifestation of orientalist stereotypes and biases. Prospero stands as the most dominant character in the play and his character, his actions, motives and above all his interaction with the island's inhabitants uh, mirror the disposition of a colonizer. Prospero's uh, supernatural powers not only secure his control over Caliban but they also require the obedience of a spirit named Ariel to carry out his mystical plans. So in the beginning, Prospero was very friendly and cordial towards Caliban because he needed Caliban's assistance and knowledge uh, to establish and strengthen his own position. However, when he feels like he has got the basic knowledge about the island, <coughs> his attitude towards <laughs> Caliban... So you please wind up your papers. So the Tempest by Shakespeare is a highly significant work in the context of post-colonial studies. It has come to symbolize resistance in a post-colonial context, exemplifying the challenges and that have risen in response to Shakespeare's colonial politics. In the play, we see elements of Orientalism with negative stereotypes about the East. For instance, characters like uh, Stefano and Trinculo discuss unicorns in Arab lands. So the character of Prospero embodies the archetypal colonizer taking on the roles of a teacher, master and a politician. He uses uh, Machiavelli's tactics using deceit and manipulation to maintain his authority and his rule. So upon his arrival, he brought with him his own language, religion and culture. He instructs Caliban in Christian values and alongside his daughter Miranda, teaches Caliban their language to uh, facilitate the execution of their commands. So this is uh, what my paper is all about, uh, but post-colonialism in the play Tempest by Shakespeare. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Sayok. Uh, you have uh, talked about two important issues, uh, uh, that post-colonial concern as well as uh, the uh, Caliban voice. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, only one suggestion that if you can uh, compare with other plays also, then I think these two concerns that you have talked about are uh, yes, ma'am. This concept can also be analyzed in other plays of Shakespeare as well. Best paper uh. in that case. Thank you, Zayu. Next, uh, Vishwajit. Uh, again, please, because lots of paper presenters are there, you may have to restrict to our time limits. Uh, so, Vishwajit, over to you. Uh, hello. I am Vishwajit, a research fellow at CDLU Sitra. My paper title is The Role of Dialogue in the character development of the identical twins in the comedy of terror. This play by Shakespeare is directly based on Latin play by Plutus about the identical antiphilus twins. As they both share the same name, they are distinguished by their city names, that is Antiphilus of Ephesus and Antiphilus of Syracuse. As humans throughout their life undergo several development and changes, these transformations occur both at physical and psychological level. The most significant roles in, the sh in shaping an individual are primarily played by their genetic inheritance. 
that becomes their nature and the external environment in which they grow and develop that becomes their nurture nature refers to the genes we are born with and hereditary factors that impact our personality throughout childhood to adulthood and on the other hand nurture refers to the environmental factors including our childhood experience our social relationships and the surrounding culture the interplay of nature and nurture is depicted in the play the comedy of errors throughout the character development the play by uh, the growth and upbringing of identical twin twin brothers antiphilus of ephesus and antiphilus of syracuse happen in two different cities they often engage in a conversation and their dialogues reflect the societal norms of their surrounding throughout the play they encounter several incidents that seem strange and unfamiliar to them but are intricately connected to their twin life the personality traits of antiphilus of ephesus are shown more on aggressive side while those of antiphilus of syracuse are inclined more on the emotional side so, the duke of syracuse uh, the sorry the duke of ephesus in the big at the beginning of the play captures a merchant named ivion who is from syracuse expressing his discontent with the fate of that city uh, he says the enmity and discord discord with the late sprung from the rancorous outrage of your duke to to merchants are well being dealing countrymen who wanting gilders to redeem their life the duke carries impulsive and sick behavior that is why to this enmity he imposes six penalties that is, if anyone from syracuse is found in their market place the person will face harsh consequences on the other hand antiphilus of syracuse who embarks on his quest to find his long lost mother and brother lands in ephesus with his servant dromio of syracuse he undergoes significant in uh, character development in the environment of ephesus he is an emotional and introspective character that is exhibited throughout the play uh, he is distressed and confused because he could not find his family which makes him feel lost in the vast world he says i to the world i am like a drop of water that in the ocean seeks another drop who falling there to find his fellow forth unseen inquisitive confound himself the monologue reflects antiphilus of syracuse's deep emotional state of longing isolation and self doubt now antiphilus of ephesus and syracuse despite their different growing environment they are some similar genetical traits they are identical twins which means they have similar physical appearance that led to a series of chaotic events this physical likeness leads to humorous situation where characters in the play misinterpret who they are dealing with thinking they are speaking to one thing when they are actually talking to others now at the end shakespeare offers a comprehensive explanation yes, please conclude your paper conclude your paper exploration between nature and nurture in the comedy of errors it develops into the character development of the identical twins showcasing how their genetic similarities shared by their shared nature and distinctively molded by their divergent environment it ultimately underscores how this interplay between nature and nurture enriches the play's exploration of identity and human behavior thank you Thank you, Vishwajit, for your presentation. Uh, you have talked about the interplay of nurture and nature. Okay. Thank you. Because of the paucity of time, I am also reducing my comments. Thank you for your presentation. Next, uh, Dr. Meena Sharma, over to you. And after Meena Sharma, uh, then uh, next is Mr. Prabhakot, and then Jyoti, Vandik, 
Kavita and Rena Malik. So please be ready with your presentations and try to wind up on time so that we will include everybody's presentation. Thank you. Dr. Veena, over to you. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, my paper is uh, titled as um, Gender Roles and Power Dynamics in Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, a reading of Isabella's monologues. I would please skip and come to the crux of my paper because basically what I want to look at here is how uh, women who speak very little in soliloquies and monologues, they have very few, let us say, soliloquies and speeches also, how Shakespeare through their soliloquies and speeches actually tries to bring in the important thematic concerns of the play. Now Measure for Measure is basically a dark comedy, a comedy which deals with the equations of power, gender dynamics, sexuality and also authority. Now over here there are three women characters, Isabella, Juliet and Mariana and Isabella is a significant character over here. She is basically a a nun and given the fact that women were confined to marginal positions during the Elizabethan times, we find that the convent was another uh, thought of to be rather a spa safe space for women. Now what happened was Isabella is basically brought out of the convent in order to plead for her brother Claudio's life and as she is brought back to society, how through her speeches we basically also understand the position that women were uh, subjected to and at the same time I think very subtly if we read between her lines we find that Shakespeare did indeed through these characters question uh, the uh, uh, let us say the, the power or the position of women. So Isabella, uh, Isabella's speech basically show her to be a a woman of independent thought. She had a deep understanding of power and authority and how power can corrupt a proud man. Now in the first speech, could great men thunder, she philosophically comments on the fragility of man's existence and the corrupting influence of power. Man's pride when dressed in a little brief authority and makes him unable to see the truth. I'm basically interested because we have paucity of time in talking about her one soliloquy which takes place in Act 2, Scene 4 and that soliloquy is uh, titled as To Whom Should I Complain? That's the first line and it is another pivotal moment in the play where Isabella grapples with her sense of powerlessness and the corrupt nature of authority. She delivers this speech after her confrontation with Angelo when he offers to save her brother Claudio from a execution in exchange for her virginity. Isabella is deeply conflicted as she is torn between her loyalty to her brother and her commitment to her religious and moral values. Isabella's speech emphasizes the vulnerability of individuals, especially women, when confronted with powerful figures in society. She questions the lack of avenues for her to seek justice and protection from the unjust use of authority. Her words underscore the helplessness of those who lack influence and power as she opines to whom should I complain did I tell this who would believe me Isabella critiques the abuse of authority and the danger of unchecked power thereby pointing out the moral decay of the powerful in society Isabella's speech also touches upon the gender dynamics and the vulnerability of women in a patriarchal society highlighting the emphasis placed on female purity and the unequal power relations between men and women in her society. Now in this soliloquy, Isabella lays, raises some fundamental questions. She is trapped between two conflicting moral imperatives, her duty as a sister to save her brother and her duty as a novice who to uphold her chastity and religious values. Her internal struggles highlight the complexity of the moral decision making and sacrifices one has to make when faced with a moral dilemma. And she becomes increasingly aware of the moral corruption and hypocrisy in the world and her determination to seek justice. There are few more other monologues of Shakespeare. I will skip those because of paucity of time. But her words like more than our brother is a... Uh, uh, 
uh, is our chastity, O faithless coward who would trust us. And when Claudio says, he uh, asks uh, Isabella to surrender to Angelo in order to save his life, all these actually indicates uh, the hypocrisy of society and the virtue that was attached to chastity, which was not considered important when it came to saving a man's life here her brother so as a woman Isabella definitely faces the challenges that are there she is mistrusted and she's used as a tool by almost all the male characters that are there in the play but we can some kind of a voice or she is able to voice the concerns of women through the limited and very liminal dialogues and soliloquies that she has throughout the play. I would definitely like to conclude by saying that though manipulated by men, Isabella tries to assert herself and is given some scope of movement. Her speeches indicate her strength and resoluteness. She questions the male figures and asserts herself and her choice by refusing to succumb to Claudio or Angelo. In her defiance and ability to question power and authority, Isabella raises important questions about the position of women in Elizabethan society, which find some space, again I would like to of course put it within quotes, some space in the, text, uh, in the Shakespearean text, because in the end Isabella enters into the patriarch uh, patriarchal fold as uh, she is uh, entered into marriage. She was initially as a nun, but later on she is absorbed into the patriarchal fold as the Duke uh, marries her. So definitely her voice is in a way silenced or she is again brought into the uh, domains of patriarchy but as a nun she definitely raises these important concerns about women and this I believe is another beauty of the Shakespearean uh, text. Thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Meena. Uh, you have uh, I think uh, very good at the presentation of yours that you have talked about gender role, even power dynamics, sexuality in major for measures. Uh, you have also talked about how the unjust uh, use of authority is there, the uh, role of women. Uh, thank you for your uh, very good presentation. Uh, next paper presenter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next uh, paper presenter, uh, Mr. Prabhakot Manas. Yes, ma'am. I'm audible, ma'am. I hope I am audible. I am proceeding with mine. Man. My paper title is The Predicament of Human Life with reference to the soliloquies and monoloquies of Hamlet and Macbeth. Uh, Shakespeare, who is known as Brad of Heaven, has produced many great works which has helped mankind to dwell upon high thought like human nature, how one should lead one's life in society and so on. Upon his major works, Hamlet and Macbeth is known as the greatest tra tragedies. These plays filled with numerous lessons to mankind, both the characters of Hamlet and Macbeth undergo suffering throughout the play, wherein Hamlet is always on the verge to take revenge and Macbeth, who is aspect for the throne, lost his mental peace even though he has acquired it with a lot of greed. So both these plays of Shakespeare has conveyed them to mankind that how life must be led with integrity and how, how a person should move forward with all the obstacles which he faces. This paper bring, brings out the important aspects in the play Hamlet, then the play Macbeth and finally concludes how the predicament of human life decides the fate of both the characters in the play. Hamlet, the character, has been designed in such a way that all through the play it is seen that his words have a lot of inner meaning and by his monologues and soliloquies, Hamlet cursed his mother for the deed of hers and sends a message to Claudius that he was aware of all the happenings in Denmark. In the soliloquy of Act 1 and Scene 2, Hamlet expresses that she is too weak and even an animal would mourn a bit longer than his mother for its mate. From the starting of this play, he expresses his displeasure towards his mother getting married to his uncle. Just a minute now. A line, a line to reiterate as to how Hamlet showed his displeasure through 
his words about his mother's relation with his uncle in the act 1 th- scene in act 3 scene 1 he says that the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to about than the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeliness through this conversation so this conversation was between hamlet and ophelia his displeasure was seen through his monologues beauty of the lines uttered by hamlet can be understandable and palatable to the readers and viewers if one can enjoy his inner philosophical thought in it in act 3 and scene 1 he says i have heard of your paintings too well enough god has given you one face and you make yourself another it seems like he is not only hurt with ophelia but also thinks about gertrude while makes while making this comment just to be clear that he has meant his mother he continues to say i say we will have no more marriages those they are married or already but one shall leave hamlet hamlet is okay with all the marriages except for one the one between claudius and gertrude throughout the play it seen that his love for his king hamlet his late father as he was not able to digest the fact that his own mother forgot about her for the first husband and started to share bed with his uncle claudius as a result that agony has given birth to most of his monologues and with ophelia and few of his soliloquies are filled with curses about his mother shakespeare highlighted the concept how dear ones undergo the suffering because of the mistakes which are made by others greed and attachment through the character gertrude hamlet's suffering is seen all through the play at the end it even haunted her it it is evident that man creates problems for himself by his own deeds claudius has displayed all the characteristics which can create downfall of every human being claudius desires gertrude and the kingdom and he harbors and he harbors anger towards king hamlet who obstructs the fulfillment of his desires these two aspects becoming the driving forces behind the entire play upon the studying of hamlet carefully we can com- comprehend that claudius divine by his desires for his brother's wife and kingdom which are unethical it is willingly to, to go to any lengths to fulfill his desires despite knowing that his wishes cannot be fulfilled until his brother king hamlet is removed from the throne and the world he acts out, out of anger and plots to kill his own siblings claudius serves as an example of someone who perishes due to their desires and anger all through the play of shakespeare all through the play shakespeare conveyed the lessons of mankind through the words of hamlet and to some extent through polonius every sentence is pregnant with deepest of the philosophy to the mankind in act 1 scene 2 hamlet says to in his soliloquy ah i wish to i wish my dirty flesh could melt away uh, manus can you please conclude manus can you... yeah man i'm just or that god has or that god has not made a law against suicide here he conveys to the mankind that that ending of one's own life is allowed is not allowed and god has not created humans to end their life through such acts my system is bit slow madam that's the reason i'm just taking a break it's not scrolling down sorry so your concluding remark you can give yes ma'am i'll just give hamlet expresses the quarrel quill kills people from within but in both the plays quarrel plays a key role but through the characters like protagonist and his allies in both the plays of shakespeare proves to the world that it is necessary for the good to fight over the weird evil if not world will see a day as told by shakespeare through the lips of lady macbeth's son in the act 4 and scene 3 then the liars are swears or fools for there are liars and swears enough to beat the honest men and hang them up that's it sorry for the glitch which happened it's okay manas thank you so much uh, you have touched upon uh, the predicament of human life and the meaning that is there uh, we can discover with reference to hamlet and macbeth 
Uh, one thing that I liked about your paper is that that you have mentioned that how man can create problems for himself or herself. That one is represented through these two plays. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your very good presentation. Uh, now next over to Jyoti. Thank you, Manas. Thank you, ma'am. After Jyoti, uh, one day please be ready for your presentation and please stick to your time limits. Excuse me, ma'am. Jyoti, are you there? Ma'am, I think uh, Jyoti, ma'am, entrusted this duty to me like she. Uh, is co-author of the paper. May I go ahead with presentation, please? Yes. 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 May I begin, yes. ma'am? May I begin? Am I audible, ma'am? Good evening, person of the session. I, Tripta Mehta, associate professor from Manohar Memorial PG College. I am the co-author of the paper, uh, To Be or Not To Be, Universality of Hamlet. As my presenter is not there, main presenter is not there, I have been entrusted this duty to do this job. Then I begin with just uh, not going into the biographical details of William Shakespeare. I would... Uh, Straight away, come to the focus of the uh, of the study. Tripta, you are not audible. Which lies on discussing. An already established fact that William Shakespeare is only the Prince of Denmark in particular. Here I am reminded of the famous essay, essayist Robert Lynch. In his famous essay, I, uh, his Fifteen days we see the full moon, only to praise it and forget it the next for a play, Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark, and to remember him through his soliloquies, monologues, and speeches. I have tried to explore the character of Hamlet himself, being a complex and multidimensional figure. He embodies the universal experience of grappling with doubt, indecision, and search for the truth. His internal struggles and philosophical musing, musings make him a relatable and compelling character for audience worldwide. To be or not to be is the soliloquy spoken by Prince Hamlet in the Act 3, Scene 1, nunnery scene of Shakespeare's play Hamlet. Unlike Hamlet's first two major soliloquies, his third and most famous speech seems to be governed by, the, by reason. Unable to do little but wait for completion of his plan to catch the conscience of the king, an internal philosophical debate goes on in, his, in the mind of Hamlet. He ponders over the advantages and disadvantages of being alive. He questions himself whether it is one's right to end his or her own life. This soliloquy of Hamlet questions the righteousness of life over death in moral terms. The speech emphasizes on the subject of death. The question in front of him is whether to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles. Hamlet contemplates the challenges and adversities of life. The Sully Lakwi possesses universal appeal as it suggests to endure the hardships and misfortunes that life throws at us. It conveys a sense of resignation and acceptance of the difficulties that come our way even if they seem unfair or unjust. 
In his soliloquy, we find Hamlet torn between two options. He contemplates whether it is better to passively endure the sufferings and in the injustices of life or to actively confront and challenge them. It reflects his internal struggle for meaning and purpose in the face of adversity. It showcases the depth of Hamlet's character and his philosophical musings on the nature of human existence. It also highlights the universal theme of the human condition as we all struggle with the choices we make in response to the challenges we encounter. Sometimes it happens that everything seems to be vague and unclear, but we have to take a decision as to what we want to do ultimately. Death is something desirable, earnestly to be wished, a consummation, a perfect closure. Death is therefore empowering, killing oneself, oneself is a way of taking action, taking up arms, opposing and defeating the slings and arrows of despicable fortune. Dying is an active state, but in order to reach the condition of death, one has to take action in life, charged fully, armed against fortune. In his speech, a hopeless prince Hamlet contemplates death and suicide while waiting for Ophelia, the love of his life. He laments on the pains and unfairness of life but acknowledges the alternative might be still worse. Within the play, the speech explains Hamlet's hesitation to directly and immediately avenge his father's murder on his uncle, his stepfather and new king Claudius. His minister Polonius have set Ophelia there in order to overhear the conversation between Hamlet and Ophelia and find out whether Hamlet is really mad or he is only pretending it. Claudius and Polonius are hiding between, behind the eras. They are preparing to eavesdrop on Hamlet's interaction with Ophelia. The soliloquy in the play portrays Hamlet as a very confused man. He is very unsure of himself and his very thoughts often waver between two extremes due to his relatively strange personality. <laughs> the question is, can you please conclude your paper? Yes, ma'am. When the question is asked in the middle of the play, it is applied to the universal man in whom the particular revenge, revenger is subsumed. To be for a man who has man's nature in him includes the conflicting passion which is natural to every human being. And doing so, it gives us a hero who is called upon to remember his heritage, to live out his human destiny and whose wish is to decline. For whatever may be said or not said about the role of Hamlet as a revenger, his dissatisfaction with the role of a man is notoriously stamped upon the play. He finds no honesty in the world. He thinks about the capricious public who once scorned his uncle in his father's time but now seems to be in favor of the present king and pays heed to the words spoken by the mighty king. Hamlet thinks about his mother, the queen, who shows the falseness of the marriage force, thoughts come into his mind that perhaps it is the nature of beautiful women to be unchaste. The world is like a garden in which all that flourishes are weeds, weeds the things in nature which are rank and gross. What makes this uh, soliloquy not only universal in its nature, but it makes Hamlet and Shakespeare with its universal appeal every time a re readable experience. Its recognition lies in the fact that it has retained its relevance throughout history. First of all, the nature of existence, the soliloquy begins with the famous line, to be or not to be, that is the question. It reflects the universal human concern with the nature of existence. We come to the human condition. Solilo this soliloquy delves into the universal human condition, including the suffering and hardships that people endure in their lives. So he spoke, he speaks of the slings and arrows of the outrageous fortune and the oppressor's wrong. So we all are afraid of the we have to please all are afraid of the unknown, that is the fear of death. That also is a universal theme. We we are always poles apart, struggling with the choices. Therefore, while reading this soliloquy. The universality is, the celebrate, is celebrated and it touch, touches upon the fundamental questions of human life. Thank you.
Thank you, Tripta. I think uh, Joya will be more than, more than happy uh, that you have presented her paper uh, on behalf of her. And you have explored the character of uh, Hamlet, uh, his internal struggles, as well as you have talked about the conflicts uh, of uh, that meaning for the purpose of life that he tried to find out. Thank you so much, Tripta. Now over to uh, Vandik. And Vandik, please uh, be stick to time. I'm uh, so welcome, ma'am. And then after that, remove your presentation, Rebhumanik, and then Kavita Singhal, uh, she will be the last presenter. So, Vandik, Rebhumanik, and Kavita. Oh, ma'am, I will. Uh, yes. Thank you, ma'am, okay. first of all, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, and I, I will definitely try to keep it in time. And a uh, very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, first of all, I'm very delighted that I got to listen to to Lisa Hopkins. That is really a big honor. I was not expecting that, but thanks a lot. Uh, that was a big surprise. And uh, I wish I was attending this seminar offline. Uh, so anyway, the title of my paper is uh, Unmasking Hamlet, A Winter into the Human Soul. Uh, the paper begins with the soliloquies of the character Hamlet in William Shakespeare's Timeless Tragedy. Hamlet are jewels of introspection and contemplation. These monologues delivered by the titular character while alone on stage provide an intimate glimpse into the inner workings of Hamlet's mind. Each soliloquy is a literary mirror reflecting his profound thoughts, moral dilemmas, and emotional turmoil. Throughout the play, these soliloquies offer audiences a unique opportunity to unravel the depths of Hamlet's character and explore the overreaching themes that drive the narrative. From the famous to be or not to be soliloquy that contemplates life and death to the poignant reflections on his inaction and indecision, Hamlet's soliloquies are a masterclass in character development and storytelling. They invite audiences to empathize with his internal struggles, whether his quest for justice, moral quandaries, or deep isolation. These soliloquies, delivered by Hamlet in moments of introspection, akin to a voice into the deepest recess of his consciousness, they provide an intimate connection between the character and the audience, unveiling the tumultuous inner workings of Hamlet's mind. Each soliloquy is the portal thoughts into a thoughts, a canvas onto which he paints his existential musings, moral quandaries, and emotional turmoil. We all know that William Shakespeare's Hamlet is a tra timeless tragedy. It is not merely a story of regal intrigue and revenge. It is a profound exploration of the human psyche, and at, at its heart are the soliloquies that encapsulates the essence of this enigmatic character. In this exploration, we will delve into the profound insights that can be gleaned from Hamlet's soliloquies. Shedding light on his intricate psychological makeup and the thematic richness that defines this Shakespearean masterpiece. Now, skipping the, all the major soliloquies and uh, the major matter, if we boil it down and condense in this paper, we come to the part that the soliloquies in the Hamlet, we notice that it is a treasure trove of literary and psychological insights. Through these introspective monologues, Shakespeare paints a vivid portrait of a character whose complexity and depth continue to captivate audiences and scholars alike. Hamlet's soliloquies are more than just a device for conveying the plot. They are the heartbeat of the play. They reveal his intellectual brilliance, moral sensitivity, and emotional turmoil. We witness his journey from a grief-stricken son mourning his father's death to a conflicted avenger struggling with the weight of his actions. Actually, we notice that this is the hamartia of the character, that this is to be or not to be, and his inability of taking decisions that whether that I should do this or should I do that, that is his failure in real life. And this is what leads to his eternal demise. These soliloquies also transcend Hamlet's character, touching on universal themes of life and death, morality and ethics, and the human condition. They invite us to ponder our existence, choices, and moral complexities. In essence, the soliloquies of Hamlet are a testament to Shakespeare's genius in crafting multidimensional characters and exploring the depths of the human psyche. They remind us that literature has the power to entertain and illuminate the profound intricacies of the human experience. 
Hamlet's soliloquy is endured as a timeless testament to the enduring power of Shakespeare's words and the enduring relevance of the themes he explored. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vandip, for two or three things. Number one, that uh, you stick to that time that is given to you. And uh, yes, ma'am, I was getting ready. The actual uh, presentation is very well framed. That unmasking Hamlet uh, window into the human soul. I think from the title only you nailed it. Uh, you have also talked about the modern dilemmas and how that soliloquies are in some or the other way are canvas. Uh, for representation of enigmatic characters, uh, introspection through the monologues, and also you have talked about the ethics and morality that is represented uh, uh, through these characters that uh, Shakespeare can create. Yes, we all know that that the creation of yes, those kinds of characters yes, that are multi-dimensional characters. Thank you so much, Vandeep, for wonderful presentation and the title of your presentation is. Thanks a lot, ma'am. It was absolutely an honor to attend uh, this. Next, uh, over Thank to Renu. Uh, Renu, again, that same request. Please stick to time. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, the title, the title of my paper is Brutus Orchard Soliloquy in Julius Caesar. A soliloquy in a play is a speech a character makes while alone on a stage or with other characters on stage who are not listening. It gives the playwright a chance to share the feeling and motivation of a character. There are multiple soliloquies are presented in William Shakespeare, Julius Caesar, out of which Brutus soliloquy in the orchard is one of the best um, example of soliloquy in Julius Caesar. He has no personal grudge against Julius Caesar, but he starts nursing some doubts about Julius Caesar after he becomes a king. A soliloquy totally expresses the agitation in his mind as to what course he should take. The whole soliloquy is based on the possibilities of Julius Caesar becoming the tyrant. His use of may, might regarding Julius Caesar's behavior is based on the poison Cassius has put into his ears. His soliloquy helps the reader understand his point of view and his motives and to understand that these motives are not personal because he is shown to be acting in the best interest of the state rather than out of personal motives. This soliloquy shows him as a reputable character with fair opinion. At the end of his soliloquy, he compares Caesar to a serpent egg and believes they may have to kill him before he hatches. When the ideas of the crown and the snake are united, Brutus says that to give Caesar such power would be to put a sting in him, making him a universal danger. Brutus does not hate Caesar at all. Caesar is his friend. What he makes is what Caesar might become, what he might do to the Roman Republic. The soliloquy gives the reader a peek into British mind regarding his future course of action. Though British is the most complex character in this play, he is very proud of his reputation for honor and nobleness, but he is not a practical person and his behavior is often new. He is the only major character in the play intensely committed to fastening his behavior to fit a strict moral and ethical code, but he takes action that are unconsciously hypocritical. One of the significant themes that Shakespeare uses to enrich the complexity of British involved is attempt to ritualize the assassination of Caesar. He cannot justify to his own satisfaction the murder of a man who is a friend and who has not excessively misused the power of his office. Unfortunately for him, he consistently misjudges the people and the citizens of Rome. He believes that they will be willing to consider the assassination in abstract terms. British concentration on honorable and noble behavior also leads him to assuming a new view of the world. He is unable to see the conspiracy being played by Cassius, Casca and Antony. He does not recognize the bogus letter has as having been sent to Cassius. He also underestimates Antony as an opponent and he loses control over the discussion at the capital following the assassination by meeting. Antony requests to readily. Brutus as a new thinker is most clearly revealed in the scene in the form. He presents his reason for the assassination and he lives believing that he has satisfied the Roman citizen with his reason oration. He does not realize that his speech has only moved the mode emotionally. 
it has not prodded them to make recent assessment of what the conspirator have done now i can conclude the orchard soliloquy that serves to presents before the audience of the brutus mind whether he should support the conspirator or side with his old friend caesar it gives us insight into his character reasoning and motivations he is a man torn between his duty to the republic his loyalty to his friend and his fear of the consequences of their actions shakespeare masterfully portrays brutus in a turmoil which makes him a complex and compelling character in the play the soliloquy also serves to present before us the nefarious design of the conspiracy thank you ma'am thank you ranu i think this is the first paper uh, in this technical session that focuses on julius caesar soliloquy and it needed guts to take that thank you so much for your very good presentation thank you uh, because uh, historical plays are difficult to dealt with for paper presentation so thank you so much for your nice presentation uh, the last paper presenter for today uh, i think kavita is waiting from the very beginning so uh, thank you kavita for your patience Uh, that you are from the very uh, initial uh... Uh, hello hello ma'am am i audible hello to kavita singha uh, i hello yeah ma'am i am Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Kindly proceed. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, ma'am, uh, Professor Nilam, for bearing with us all. <laughs> A very good afternoon. Uh, I have concentrated in uh, my paper on Portia's soliloquy in *The Merchant of Venice*. Uh, I am just talking about the crux of my paper. In the polarized times of today. where hate sells and thrives humanity needs literature solace it is shakespeare who through portia's words espouses in the merchant of venice act 4 scene 1 the quality of mercy is not forceful actually it is as natural as the rain comes on the earth and he talks about its double blessing it blesses both the giver and the taker these words become especially relevant in the present day as the word watches with bated breath the brutality of war in gaza and israel as humans turn on each other we lose sight of growing together as a human race as we shut away our conscience and resign ourselves to becoming cogs in the cycle of hate we become part of the problem the merciful road may not be maybe a harder to take but it is after all the higher road it is doubly rewarding to walk this path as we not just soothe ourselves but also those around us our world today is in dire need of this gentle rain of mercy from the sky instead of the missiles or hate speeches i must say as we turn towards mercy and forgiveness we are born again as a human human species that day encumbered by the shackles of hate we will walk hand in hand towards a better tomorrow pushya soliloquy in william shakespeare's merchant of venice is taken for in that study in my paper actually pushya disguised as a learned jurist balthazar is on the verge of presiding over the trial between shylock and antonio in the soliloquy pushya engages in a profound contemplation of concepts such as mercy justice and the repercussions of such human actions notably she articulates the famous lines the quality of mercy is not strained it dropped as the gentle rain from heaven emphasizing the notion that mercy mercy should be given as naturally as the rains come and nature nurture the earth this paper elucidates how this soliloquy foreshadows the trial's outcome and reiterates portia's sagacity and strategic prowess 
Furthermore, he dives into the moral and philosophical dimensions of the speech, offering insight into Shakespeare's nuanced treatment of mercy and compassion in a world rife with avarice and retribution. It puts emphasis on the significance of mercy and human empathy, enduring themes and that resonate across temporal and societal boundaries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, uh, thank you Kavita for your presentation. Uh, some kind of a lag is there. So we heard your last sentence later on. Uh, okay. Was looking at me. So I, I predicted that yes, you have completed, but we have your last session later on. Last sentence. Thank you for uh, bringing this uh, new concept of that Oshia's character and contemporaneity in that uh, through your presentation. Uh, thank you, Kavita, and thank you everyone who all are still there connected online. Generally, we have seen that when your presentation is over, you just left. But I think Meena is already there. Uh, then uh, other presenters, uh, Vandik and other, are already there uh, with us. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for your nice presentations and waiting us uh, till this time because of some uh, technical issues. Uh, I think now everybody is about to leave and all students who are connected with us sitting there offline, they are also waiting us to wind up this session. Thank you everyone and thank you uh, all the organizers for inviting me and thank you for all the paper presenters for your nice presentations. Thank you ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so, so much ma'am. I would like to express my gratitude on behalf of the Department of English and the Shakespeare Association of India for being so generous with your praise and so effectively moderating this session. At one point, even I felt like presenting a paper so that I can hear some sweet words of praise from you. I'm sure all our presenters also felt the same. I also like to, I would also like to extend gratitude to our presenters, Dr. Akamsha Kaushik, Ms. Priyanka, Mr. Dinesh Kumar, Ms. Pallavi, Mr. Sayyuk Sethi, Vishwajit Singh, Dr. Meena Sharma, Mr. Prabodha Manas, Dr. Tripta Mehta, uh, Mr. Vandi Dhillon, Dr. Renu Malik and Dr. Kavita Singla. Please forgive me if I left anybody out. Thank you so much for your intensively researched papers. It was a delight to hear you all. Thank you so much.